Section 2 of State of the Union Addresses, 1845-1848. to This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. State of the Union Address, James Polk, December 2nd, 1845, Part 2. All attempts at compromise having failed, it becomes the duty of Congress to consider what measures it may be proper to adopt for the security and protection of our citizens now inhabiting or who may hereafter inhabit Oregon, and for the maintenance of our just title to that territory. In adopting measures for this purpose, care should be taken that nothing be done to violate the stipulations of the Convention of 1827, which is still in force. The faith of treaties, in their letter and spirit, has ever been, and I trust will ever be, scrupulously observed by the United States. Under that convention, a year's notice is required to be given by either party to the other before the joint occupancy shall terminate, and before either can rightfully assert or exercise exclusive jurisdiction over any portion of the territory. This notice it would in my judgment be proper to give and i recommend that provision be made by law for giving it accordingly and terminating in this manner the convention of the sixth of august eighteen twenty seven it will become proper for congress to determine what legislation they can in the meantime adopt without violating this convention Beyond all question, the protection of our laws and our jurisdiction, civil and criminal, ought to be immediately extended over our citizens in Oregon. They have had just cause to complain of our long neglect in this particular, and have in consequence been compelled for their own security and protection to establish a provisional government for themselves strong in their allegiance and ardent in their attachment to the united states they have been thus cast upon their own resources they are anxious that our laws should be extended over them and i recommend that this be done by congress with as little delay as possible in the full extent to which the british parliament have proceeded in regard to british subjects in that territory by their act of july second eighteen twenty one for regulating the fur trade and establishing a criminal and civil jurisdiction within certain parts of north america by this act great britain extended her laws and jurisdiction civil and criminal over her subjects engaged in the fur trade in that territory by it the courts of the province of upper canada were empowered to take cognizance of causes civil and criminal justices of the peace and other judicial officers were authorized to be appointed in oregon with power to execute all processes issuing from the courts of that province and to sit and hold courts of record for the trial of criminal offenses and misdemeanors not made the subject of capital punishment and also of civil cases where the cause of action shall not exceed in value the amount sum of two hundred pounds subsequent to the date of this act of parliament a grant was made from the british crown to the hudson's bay company of the exclusive trade with the indian tribes in the oregon territory subject to a reservation that it shall not operate to the exclusion of the subjects of any foreign states who under or by force of any convention for the time being between us and such foreign states respectively may be entitled to and shall be engaged in the said trade it is much to be regretted that while under this act british subjects have enjoyed the protection of british laws and british judicial tribunals throughout the whole of oregon american citizens in the same territory have enjoyed no such protection from their government at the same time the result illustrates the character of our people and their institutions in spite of this neglect they have multiplied and their number is rapidly increasing in that territory they have made no appeal to arms 
but have peacefully fortified themselves in their new homes by the adoption of republican institutions for themselves furnishing another example of the truth that self-government is inherent in the american breast and must prevail it is due to them that they should be embraced and protected by our laws it is deemed important that our laws regulating trade and intercourse with the indian tribes east of the rocky mountains should be extended to such tribes as dwell beyond them the increasing emigration to oregon and the care and protection which is due from the government to its citizens in that distant region make it our duty as it is our interest to cultivate amicable relations with the indian tribes of that territory for this purpose i recommend that provision be made for establishing an indian agency and such sub-agencies as may be deemed necessary beyond the rocky mountains for the protection of emigrants whilst on their way to oregon against the attacks of the indian tribes occupying the country through which they pass i recommend that a suitable number of stockades and blockhouse forts be erected along the usual route between our frontier settlements on the missouri and the rocky mountains and that an adequate force of mounted riflemen be raised to guard and protect them on their journey the immediate adoption of these recommendations by congress will not violate the provisions of the existing treaty it will be doing nothing more for american citizens than british laws have long since done for british subjects in the same territory it requires several months to perform the voyage by sea from the atlantic states to oregon and although we have a large number of whale ships in the pacific but few of them afford an opportunity of interchanging intelligence without great delay between our settlements in that distant region and the united states an overland mail is believed to be entirely practicable and the importance of establishing such a mail at least once a month is submitted to the favorable consideration of congress it is submitted to the wisdom of congress to determine whether at their present session and until after the expiration of the year's notice any other measures may be adopted consistently with the convention of eighteen twenty seven for the security of our rights in the government and protection of our citizens in oregon that it will ultimately be wise and proper to make liberal grants of land to the patriotic pioneers who amidst privations and dangers lead the way through savage tribes inhabiting the vast wilderness intervening between our frontier settlements and oregon and who cultivate and are ever ready to defend the soil i am fully satisfied to doubt whether they will obtain such grants as soon as the convention between the united states and great britain shall have ceased to exist would be to doubt the justice of congress but pending the year's notice it is worthy of consideration whether a stipulation to this effect may be made consistently with the spirit of that convention the recommendations which i have made as to the best manner of securing our rights in oregon are submitted to congress with great deference should they in their wisdom devise any other mode better calculated to accomplish the same object it shall meet with my hearty concurrence at the end of the year's notice should congress think it proper to make provision for giving that notice we shall have reached a period when the national rights in oregon must either be abandoned or firmly maintained that they cannot be abandoned without sacrifice of both national honor and interest is too clear to admit of doubt oregon is part of the north american continent to which it is confidently affirmed the title of the united states is the best now in existence for the grounds on which that title rests i refer you to the correspondence of the late and present secretary of state with the british plenipotentiary during the negotiation the british proposition of compromise 
which would make the Columbia, the line south of 49, with a trifling addition of detached territory to the United States north of that river, and would leave on the British side two-thirds of the whole Oregon territory, including the free navigation of the Columbia, and all the valuable harbors on the Pacific, can never for a moment be entertained by the United States, without an abandonment of their just and dear territorial rights, their own self-respect, and the national honor. For the information of Congress, I communicate herewith the correspondence which took place between the two governments during the late negotiation. The rapid extension of our settlements over our territories heretofore unoccupied the addition of new states to our confederacy, the expansion of free principles and our rising greatness as a nation, are attracting the attention of the powers of Europe, and lately the doctrine has been broached in some of them of a balance of power on this continent to check our advancement. The United States sincerely desirous of preserving relations of good understanding with all nations cannot in silence permit any european interference on the north american continent and should any such interference be attempted will be ready to resist at any and all hazards it is well known to the american people and to all nations this government has never interfered with the relations subsisting between other governments. We have never made ourselves parties to their wars or their alliances. We have not sought their territories by conquest. We have not mingled with the parties in their domestic struggles. And believing our own form of government to be the best, we have never attempted to propagate it by intrigues, by diplomacy or by force. We may claim on this continent a like exemption from European interference. The nations of America are equally sovereign and independent with those of Europe. They possess the same rights. Independent of all foreign interposition to make war, to conclude peace, and to regulate their internal affairs. The people of the United States cannot, therefore, view with indifference attempts of European powers to interfere with the independent action of the nations on this continent. The American system of government is entirely different from that of Europe. Jealousy among the different sovereigns of Europe, lest any one of them might become too powerful for the rest, has caused them anxiously to desire the establishment of what they term the balance of power. It cannot be permitted to have any application on the North American continent, and especially to the United States. We must ever maintain the principle that the people of this continent alone have the right to decide their own destiny. Should any portion of them, constituting an independent state, propose to unite themselves with our Confederacy, this will be a question for them and us to determine without any foreign interposition. We can never consent that European powers shall interfere to prevent such a union, because it might disturb the balance of power, which they may desire to maintain upon this continent. Near a quarter century ago, the principle was distinctly announced to the world in the annual message of one of my predecessors that the American continents, by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintain, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for colonization by any European powers. This principle will apply with greatly increased force should any European power attempt to establish any new colony in North America. In the existing circumstances of the world, the present is deemed a proper occasion to reiterate and reaffirm the principle avowed by Mr. Monroe, and to state my cordial concurrence in its wisdom and sound policy. The reassertion of this principle, especially in reference to North America, is at this day 
but the promulgation of a policy which no european power should cherish the disposition to resist existing rights of every european nation should be respected but it is due alike to our safety and our interests that the efficient protection of our laws should be extended over our whole territorial limits and that it should be distinctly announced to the world as our settled policy that no future european colony or dominion shall with our consent be planted or established on any part of the north american continent a question has recently arisen under the tenth article of the subsisting treaty between the united states and prussia by this article the consuls of the two countries have the right to sit as judges and arbitrators in such differences as may arise between the captains and crews of the vessels belonging to the nation whose interests are committed to their charge without the interference of the local authorities unless the conduct of the crews or of the captain should disturb the order or tranquillity of the country or the said consuls should require their assistance to cause their decisions to be carried into effect or supported the prussian consul at new bedford in june 1844 applied to mr justice story to carry into effect a decision made by him between the captain and crew of the prussian ship for russia but the request was refused on the ground that without previous legislation by congress the judiciary did not possess the power to give effect to this article of the treaty the prussian government through their minister here have complained of this violation of the treaty and have asked the government of the united states to adopt the necessary measures to prevent similar violations hereafter good faith to prussia as well as to other nations with whom we have similar treaty stipulations requires that these should be faithfully observed i have deemed it proper therefore to lay the subject before congress and to recommend such legislation as may be necessary to give effect to these treaty obligations by virtue of an arrangement made between the spanish government and that of the united states in december eighteen thirty one american vessels since the twenty ninth of april eighteen thirty two have been admitted to entry in the ports of spain including those of the balearic and canary islands on payment of the same tonnage duty of five cents per ton as though they had been spanish vessels and this whether our vessels arrive in spain directly from the united states or indirectly from any other country when congress by the act of thirteen july eighteen thirty two gave effect to this arrangement between the two governments they confined the reduction of tonnage duty merely to spanish vessels coming from a port in spain leaving the former discriminating duty to remain against such vessels coming from a port in any other country it is manifestly unjust that whilst american vessels arriving in the ports of spain from other countries pay no more duty than spanish vessels spanish vessels arriving in the ports of the united states from other countries should be subjected to heavy discriminating tonnage duties this is neither equality nor reciprocity and is in violation of the arrangement concluded in december eighteen thirty one between the two countries the spanish government have made repeated and earnest remonstrances against this inequality and the favorable attention of congress has been several times invoked to the subject by my predecessors i recommend as an act of justice to spain that this inequality be removed by congress and that the discriminating duties which have been levied under the act of the thirteenth of july eighteen thirty two on spanish vessels coming to the united states from any other foreign country be refunded this recommendation does not embrace spanish vessels arriving in the united states from cuba and puerto rico 
which will still remain subject to the provisions of the act of june thirty eighteen thirty four concerning tonnage duty on such vessels by the act of fourteenth of july eighteen thirty two coffee was exempted from duty altogether the exemption was universal without reference to the country where it was produced or the national character of the vessel in which it was imported by the tariff act of the thirtieth of august eighteen forty two this exemption from duty was restricted to coffee imported in american vessels from the place of its production whilst coffee imported under all other circumstances was subjected to a duty of twenty per cent ad valorem under this act and our existing treaty with the king of the netherlands java coffee imported from the european ports of that kingdom into the united states whether in dutch or american vessels now pays this rate of duty the government of the netherlands complains that such a discriminating duty should have been imposed on coffee the production of one of its colonies and which is chiefly brought from java to the ports of that kingdom and exported from thence to foreign countries our trade with the netherlands is highly beneficial to both countries and our relations with them have ever been on the most friendly character under all the circumstances of the case i recommend that this discrimination should be abolished and that the coffee of java imported from the netherlands be placed upon the same footing with that imported directly from brazil and other countries where it is produced under the eighth section of the tariff act of the thirtieth of august eighteen forty two a duty of fifteen cents per gallon was imposed on port wine in casks while on the red wines of several other countries when imported in casks a duty of only six cents per gallon was imposed this discrimination so far as regarded the port wine of portugal was deemed a violation of our treaty with that power which provides that no higher or other duties shall be imposed on the importation into the united states of america of any article the growth produce or manufacture of the kingdom and possessions of portugal then such as are or shall be payable on the like article being the growth produce or manufacture of any other foreign country accordingly to give effect to the treaty as well as to the intention of congress expressed in a proviso to the tariff act itself that nothing therein contained should be so construed as to interfere with subsisting treaties with foreign nations a treasury circular was issued on the sixteenth of july eighteen forty four which among other things declared the duty on the port wine of portugal in casks under the existing laws and treaty to be six cents per gallon and directed that the excess of duties which have been collected on such wine should be refunded by virtue of another clause in the same section of the act it is provided that all imitations of port or any other wines shall be subject to the duty provided for the genuine article imitations of port wine the production of france are imported to some extent into the united states and the government of that country now claims that under a correct construction of the act these imitations ought not to pay a higher duty than that imposed upon the original port wine of portugal it appears to me to be unequal and unjust that french imitations of port wine should be subjected to a duty of fifteen cents while the more valuable article of portugal should pay a duty of six cents only per gallon i therefore recommend to congress such legislation as may be necessary to correct the inequality the late president in his annual message of december last recommended an appropriation to satisfy the claims of the texan government against the united states which had been previously adjusted so far as the powers of the executive extend 
these claims arose out of the act of disarming a body of texan troops under the command of major snively by an officer in the service of the united states acting under the orders of our government and the forcible entry into the custom-house at byerly's landing on red river by certain citizens of the united states and taking away therefrom the goods seized by the collector of the customs as forfeited under the laws of texas this was a liquidated debt ascertained to be due to texas when an independent state her acceptance of the terms of annexation proposed by the united states does not discharge or invalidate the claim i recommend that provision be made for its payment the commissioner appointed to china during the special session of the senate in march last shortly afterwards set out on his mission in the united states ship columbus on arriving at rio de janeiro on his passage the state of his health had become so critical that by the advice of his medical attendants he returned to the united states early in the month of october last commodore biddle commanding the east india squadron proceeded on his voyage in the columbus and was charged by the commissioner with the duty of exchanging with the proper authorities the ratifications of the treaty lately concluded with the emperor of china since the return of the commissioner to the united states his health has been much improved and he entertains the confident belief that he will soon be able to proceed on his mission unfortunately differences continue to exist among some of the nations of south america which following our example have established their independence while in others internal dissensions prevail it is natural that our sympathies should be warmly enlisted for their welfare that we should desire that all controversies between them should be amicably adjusted and their governments administered in a manner to protect the rights and promote the prosperity of their people it is contrary however to our settled policy to interfere in their controversies whether external or internal i have thus adverted to all the subjects connected with our foreign relations to which i deem it necessary to call your attention our policy is not only peace with all but good will toward all the powers of the earth while we are just to all we require that all shall be just to us excepting the differences with mexico and great britain our relations with all civilized nations are of the most satisfactory character it is hoped that in this enlightened age these differences may be amicably adjusted the secretary of the treasury in his annual report to congress will communicate a full statement of the condition of our finances the imports for the fiscal year ending on the thirtieth of june last were of the value of one hundred and seventeen million two hundred and fifty four thousand five hundred and sixty four dollars of which the amount exported was fifteen million three hundred and forty six thousand eight hundred and thirty dollars leaving a balance of one hundred and one million nine hundred and seven thousand seven hundred and thirty four dollars for domestic consumption the exports for the same year were of the value of one hundred and fourteen million six hundred and forty six thousand six hundred and six dollars of which the amount of domestic articles was ninety nine million two hundred and ninety nine thousand seven hundred and seventy six dollars the receipts into the treasury during the same year were twenty nine million seven hundred and sixty nine thousand one hundred and thirty three dollars and fifty six cents of which there were derived from customs twenty seven million five hundred and twenty eight thousand one hundred and twenty two dollars and seventy cents from sales of public lands two million seventy seven thousand twenty two dollars and thirty cents and from incidental and miscellaneous sources 
one hundred and sixty three thousand nine hundred and ninety eight dollars and fifty six cents the expenditures for the same period were twenty nine million nine hundred and sixty eight thousand two hundred and six dollars and ninety eight cents of which eight million five hundred and eighty eight thousand one hundred and fifty seven dollars and sixty two cents were applied to the payment of the public debt the balance in the treasury on the first of july last was seven million six hundred and fifty eight thousand three hundred and six dollars and twenty two cents the amount of the public debt remaining unpaid on the first of october last was seventeen million seventy five thousand four hundred and forty five dollars and fifty two cents further payments of the public debt would have been made in anticipation of the period of its reimbursement under the authority conferred upon the secretary of the treasury by the acts of july twenty one eighteen forty one and of april fifteenth eighteen forty two and march third eighteen forty three had not the unsettled state of our relations with mexico menaced hostile collision with that power in view of such a contingency it was deemed prudent to retain in the treasury an amount unusually large for ordinary purposes a few years ago our whole national debt growing out of the revolution and the war of eighteen twelve with great britain was extinguished and we presented to the world the rare and noble spectacle of a great and growing people who had fully discharged every obligation since that time the existing debt has been contracted and small as it is in comparison with the similar burdens of most other nations it should be extinguished at the earliest practicable period should the state of the country permit and especially if our foreign relations interpose no obstacle it is contemplated to apply all the monies in the treasury as they accrue beyond what is required for the appropriations by congress to its liquidation i cherish the hope of soon being able to congratulate the country on its recovering once more the lofty position which it so recently occupied our country which exhibits to the world the benefits of self-government in developing all the sources of national prosperity owes to mankind the permanent example of a nation free from the blighting influence of a public debt the attention of congress is invited to the importance of making suitable modifications and reductions of the rates of duty imposed by our present tariff laws the object of imposing duties on imports should be to raise revenue to pay the necessary expenses of government congress may undoubtedly in the exercise of a sound discretion discriminate in arranging the rates of duty on different articles but the discriminations should be within the revenue standard and be made with the view to raise money for the support of government it becomes important to understand distinctly what is meant by a revenue standard the maximum of which should not be exceeded in the rates of duty imposed it is conceded and experience proves that duties may be laid so high as to diminish or prohibit altogether the importation of any given article and thereby lessen or destroy the revenue which at lower rates would be derived from its importation such duties exceed the revenue rates and are not imposed to raise money for the support of government if congress levy a duty for revenue of one per cent on a given article it will produce a given amount of money to the treasury and will incidentally and necessarily afford protection or advantage to the amount of one per cent to the home manufacturer of a similar or like article over the importer if the duty be raised to ten per cent it will produce a greater amount of money and afford greater protection if it be still raised to twenty 
twenty-five, or thirty per cent, and if, as it is raised, the revenue derived from it is found to be increased, the protection or advantage will also be increased. But if it be raised to thirty-one per cent, and it is found that the revenue produced at that rate is less than at thirty per cent, it ceases to be a revenue duty. The precise point in the ascending scale of duties at which it is ascertained from experience that the revenue is greatest is the maximum rate of duty which can be laid for the bona fide purpose of collecting money for the support of government to raise the duties higher than that point and thereby diminish the amount collected is to levy them for protection merely and not for revenue as long then as congress may gradually increase the rate of duty on a given article and the revenue is increased by such increase of duty they are within the revenue standard when they go beyond that point and as they increase the duties the revenue is diminished or destroyed the act ceases to have for its object the raising of money to support government but is for protection merely it does not follow that Congress should levy the highest duty on all articles of import which they will bear within the revenue standard, for such rates would probably produce a much larger amount than the economical administration of the government would require. Nor does it follow that the duties on all articles should be at the same or a horizontal rate. Some articles will bear a much higher revenue duty than others below the maximum of the revenue standard congress may and ought to discriminate in the rates imposed taking care so to adjust them on different articles as to produce in the aggregate the amount which when added to the proceeds of the sales of public lands may be needed to pay the economical expenses of the government in levying a tariff of duties congress exercises the taxing power and for purposes of revenue may select the objects of taxation they may exempt certain articles altogether and permit their importation free of duty on others they may impose low duties in these classes should be embraced such articles of necessity as are in general use and especially such as are consumed by the laborer and poor as well as by the wealthy citizen care should be taken that all the great interests of the country including manufacturers agriculture commerce navigation and the mechanic arts should as far as may be practicable derive equal advantages from the incidental protection which a just system of revenue duties may afford taxation direct or indirect is a burden and it should be so imposed as to operate as equally as may be on all classes in the proportion of their ability to bear it to make the taxing power an actual benefit to one class necessarily increases the burden of the others beyond their proportion and would be manifestly unjust the terms protection to domestic industry are of popular import but they should apply under a just system to all the various branches of industry in our country the farmer or planter who toils yearly in his fields is engaged in domestic industry and is as much entitled to have his labor protected as the manufacturer the man of commerce the navigator or the mechanic who are engaged also in domestic industry in their different pursuits the joint labors of all these classes constitute the aggregate of the domestic industry of the nation and they are equally entitled to the nation's protection no one of them can justly claim to be the exclusive recipient of protection which can only be afforded by increasing burdens on the domestic industry of the others if these views be correct it remains to inquire how far the tariff act of eighteen forty two is consistent with them that many of the provisions of the act are in violation of the cardinal principles here laid down all must concede 
the rates of duty imposed by it on some articles are prohibitory and others so high as greatly to diminish importations and to produce a less amount of revenue than would be derived from lower rates they operate as protection merely to one branch of domestic industry by taxing other branches by the introduction of minimums or assumed and false values and by the imposition of specific duties the injustice and inequality of the act of eighteen forty two in its practical operations on different classes and pursuits are seen and felt many of the oppressive duties imposed by it under the operation of these principles range from one per cent to more than two hundred per cent they are prohibitory on some articles and partially so on others and bear most heavily on articles of common necessity and but lightly on articles of luxury it is so framed that much the greatest burden which it imposes is thrown on labor and the poorer classes who are least able to bear it while it protects capital and exempts the rich from paying their just proportion of the taxation required for the support of government while it protects the capital of the wealthy manufacturer and increases his profits it does not benefit the operatives or laborers in his employment whose wages have not been increased by it articles of prime necessity or of coarse quality and low price used by the masses of the people are in many instances subjected by it to heavy taxes while articles of finer quality and higher price or of luxury which can be used only by the opulent are lightly taxed it imposes heavy and unjust burdens on the farmer the planter the commercial man and those of all other pursuits except the capitalist who has made his investments in manufactures all the great interests of the country are not as nearly as may be practicable equally protected by it the government in theory knows no distinction of persons or classes and should not bestow upon some favors and privileges which all or others may not enjoy it was the purpose of its illustrious founders to base the institutions which they reared upon the great and unchanging principles of justice and equity conscious that if administered in the spirit in which they were conceived they would be felt only by the benefits which they diffused and would secure for themselves a defence in the hearts of the people more powerful than standing armies and all the means and appliances invented to sustain governments founded in injustice and oppression the well-known fact that the tariff act of eighteen forty two was passed by a majority of one vote in the senate and two in the house of representatives and that some of those who felt themselves constrained under the peculiar circumstances existing at the time to vote in its favor proclaimed its defects and expressed their determination to aid in its modification on the first opportunity affords strong and conclusive evidence that it was not intended to be permanent and of the expediency and necessity of its thorough revision in recommending to congress a reduction of the present rates of duty and a revision and modification of the act of eighteen forty two i am far from entertaining opinions unfriendly to manufacturers on the contrary i desire to see them prosperous as far as they can be so without imposing unequal burdens on other interests the advantage under any system of indirect taxation even within the revenue standard must be in favor of the manufacturing interest and of this no other interest will complain i recommend to congress the abolition of the minimum principle or assumed arbitrary and false values and of specific duties and the substitution in their place of ad valorem duties as the fairest and most equitable indirect tax which can be imposed by the ad valorem principle all articles are taxed according to their cost or value 
and those which are of inferior quality or of small cost bear only the just proportion of the tax with those which are of superior quality or greater cost the articles consumed by all are taxed at the same rate a system of ad valorem revenue duties with proper discriminations and proper guards against frauds in collecting them it is not doubted will afford ample incidental advantages to the manufacturers and enable them to derive as great profits as can be derived from any other regular business it is believed that such a system strictly within the revenue standard will place the manufacturing interests on a stable footing and ensure to their permanent advantage while it will as nearly as may be practicable extend to all the great interests of the country the incidental protection which can be afforded by our revenue laws such a system when once firmly established would be permanent and not be subject to the constant complaints agitations and changes which must ever occur when duties are not laid for revenue but for the protection merely of a favorite interest in the deliberations of congress on this subject it is hoped that a spirit of mutual concession and compromise between conflicting interests may prevail and that the result of their labors may be crowned with the happiest consequences end of section two Section 3 of State of the Union Addresses, 1845-1848. to This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. State of the Union Address, James Polk, December 2nd, 1845, Part 3. By the Constitution of the United States, it is provided that no money shall be drawn from the treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law a public treasury was undoubtedly contemplated and intended to be created in which the public money should be kept from the period of collection until needed for public uses in the collection and disbursement of the public money no agencies have ever been employed by law except such as were appointed by the government directly responsible to it and under its control the safe keeping of the public money should be confided to a public treasury created by law and under like responsibility and control it is not to be imagined that the framers of the constitution could have intended that a treasury should be created as a place of deposit and safe keeping of the public money which was irresponsible to the government the first congress under the constitution by the act of the second of september seventeen eighty nine to establish the treasury department provided for the appointment of a treasurer and made it his duty to receive and keep the monies of the united states and at all times to submit to the secretary of the treasury and the comptroller or either of them the inspection of the monies in his hands that banks, national or state, could not have been intended to be used as a substitute for the treasury, spoken of in the Constitution, as keepers of the public money, it's manifest from the fact that at the time there was no national bank, but three or four state banks of limited capital existed in the country. Their employment as depositories was at first resorted to, to a limited extent, but with no avowed intention of continuing them permanently in place of the treasury of the constitution when they were afterwards from time to time employed it was from motives of supposed convenience our experience has shown that when banking corporations have been the keepers of the public money and been thereby made in effect the treasury the government can have no guarantee that it can command the use of its own money for public purposes the late bank of the united states proved to be faithless the state banks which were afterwards employed were faithless but a few years ago with millions of public money in their keeping the government was brought almost to bankruptcy 
and the public credit seriously impaired because of their inability or indisposition to pay on demand to the public creditors in the only currency recognized by the constitution their failure occurred in a period of peace a great inconvenience and loss were suffered by the public from it had the country been involved in a foreign war that inconvenience and loss would have been much greater and might have resulted in extreme public calamity the public money should not be mingled with the private funds of banks or individuals or be used for private purposes when it is placed in banks for safe keeping it is in effect loaned to them without interest and is loaned by them upon interest to the borrowers from them the public money is converted into banking capital and is used and loaned out for the private profit of bank stockholders and when called for as was the case in eighteen thirty seven it may be in the pockets of the borrowers from the banks instead of being in the public treasury contemplated by the constitution the framers of the constitution could never have intended that the money paid into the treasury should be thus converted to private use and placed beyond the control of the government banks which hold the public money are often tempted by a desire of gain to extend their loans increase their circulation and thus stimulate if not produce a spirit of speculation and extravagance which sooner or later must result in ruin to thousands if the public money be not permitted to be thus used but be kept in the treasure and paid out to the public creditors in gold and silver the temptation afforded by its deposit with banks to an undue expansion of their business would be checked while the amount of the constitutional currency left in circulation would be enlarged by its employment in the public collections and disbursements and the banks themselves would in consequence be found in a safer and sounder condition at present state banks are employed as depositories but without adequate regulation of law whereby the public money can be secured against the casualties and excesses revulsions suspensions and defalcations to which from over issues over trading and inordinate desire for gain or other causes they are constantly exposed the secretary of the treasury has in all cases when it was practicable taken collateral security for the amount which they hold by the pledge of stocks of the united states or such of the states as were in good credit some of the deposit banks have given this description of security and others have declined to do so entertaining the opinion that the separation of the monies of the government from banking institutions is indispensable for the safety of the funds of the government and the rights of the people i recommend to congress that provision be made by law for such separation and that a constitutional treasury be created for the safe keeping of the public money the constitutional treasury recommended is designed as a secure depository for the public money without any power to make loans or discounts or to issue any paper whatever as a currency or circulation i cannot doubt that such a treasury as was contemplated by the constitution should be independent of all banking corporations the money of the people should be kept in the treasury of the people created by law and be in the custody of agents of the people chosen by themselves according to the forms of the constitution agents who are directly responsible to the government who are under adequate bonds and oaths and who are subject to severe punishments for any embezzlement private use or misapplication of the public funds and for any failure in other respects to perform their duties 
to say that the people or their government are incompetent or not to be trusted with the custody of their own money in their own treasury provided by themselves but must rely on the presidents cashiers and stockholders of banking corporations not appointed by them nor responsible to them would be to concede that they are incompetent for self-government in recommending the establishment of a constitutional treasury in which the public money shall be kept i desire that adequate provision be made by law for its safety and that all executive discretion or control over it shall be removed except such as may be necessary in directing its disbursement in pursuance of appropriations made by law under our present land system limiting the minimum price at which the public lands can be entered to a dollar twenty five per acre large quantities of lands of inferior quality remain unsold because they will not command that price from the records of the general land office it appears that on the public lands remaining unsold in the several states and territories in which they are situated thirty nine million one hundred and five thousand five hundred and seventy seven acres have been in the market subject to entry more than twenty years forty nine million six hundred and thirty eight thousand six hundred and forty four acres for more than fifteen years seventy three million seventy four thousand six hundred acres for more than ten years and one hundred and six million one hundred and seventy six thousand nine hundred and sixty one acres for more than five years much the largest portion of these lands will continue to be unsaleable at the minimum price at which they are permitted to be sold so long as large territories of lands from which the more valuable portions have not been selected are annually brought into market by the government with the view to the sale and settlement of these inferior lands i recommend that the price be graduated and reduced below the present minimum rate confining sales at the reduced prices to settlers and cultivators in limited quantities if graduated and reduced in price for a limited term to one dollar per acre and after the expiration of that period for a second and third term to lower rates a large portion of these lands would be purchased and many worthy citizens who are unable to pay higher rates could purchase homes for themselves and their families by adopting the policy of graduation and reduction of price these inferior lands will be sold for their real value while the states in which they lie will be freed from the inconvenience if not injustice to which they are subjected in consequence of the united states continuing to own large quantities of the public lands within their borders not liable to taxation for the support of their local governments i recommend the continuance of the policy of granting preemptions in its most liberal extent to all those who have settled or may hereafter settle on the public lands whether surveyed or unsurveyed to which the indian title may have been extinguished at the time of settlement it has been found by experience that in consequence of combination of purchasers and other causes a very small quantity of the public lands when sold at public auction commands a higher price than the minimum rates established by law the settlers on the public lands are however but rarely able to secure their homes and improvements at the public sales at that rate because these combinations by means of the capital they command and their superior ability to purchase render it impossible for the settler to compete with them in the market by putting down all competition these combinations of capitalists and speculators are usually enabled to purchase the lands including the improvements of the settlers at the minimum price of the government and either turn them out of their homes or extort from them according to their ability to pay double or quadruple the amount paid for them to the government it is to the enterprise and perseverance of the hardy pioneers of the west who penetrate the wilderness with their families suffer the dangers the privations 
and hardships attending the settlement of a new country and prepare the way for the body of emigrants who in the course of a few years usually follow them that we are in a great degree indebted for the rapid extension and aggrandizement of our country experience has proved that no portion of our population are more patriotic than the hardy and brave men of the frontier or more ready to obey the call of their country and to defend her rights and her honor whenever and by whatever enemy assailed they should be protected from the grasping speculator and secured at the minimum price of the public lands in the humble homes which they have improved by their labor with this end in view all vexations or unnecessary restrictions imposed upon them by the existing preemption laws should be repealed or modified it is the true policy of the government to afford facilities to its citizens to become the owners of small portions of our vast public domain at low and moderate rates the present system of managing the mineral lands of the united states is believed to be radically defective more than one million acres of the public lands supposed to contain lead and other minerals have been reserved from sale and numerous leases upon them have been granted to individuals upon a stipulated rent the system of granting leases has proved to be not only unprofitable to the government but unsatisfactory to the citizens who have gone upon the lands and must if continued lay the foundation of much future difficulty between the government and the leasees according to the official records the amount of rents received by the government for the years eighteen forty one eighteen forty two eighteen forty three and eighteen forty four was six thousand three hundred and fifty four dollars and seventy four cents while the expenses of the system during the same period including salaries of superintendents agents clerks and incidental expenses were twenty six thousand one hundred and eleven dollars and eleven cents the income being less than one-fourth of the expenses to this pecuniary loss may be added the injury sustained by the public in consequence of the destruction of timber and the careless and wasteful manner of working the mines the system has given rise to much litigation between the united states and individual citizens producing irritation and excitement in the mineral region and involving the government in heavy additional expenditures it is believed that similar losses and embarrassments will continue to occur while the present system of leasing these lands remains unchanged these lands are now under the superintendence and care of the war department with the ordinary duties of which they have no proper or natural connection i recommend the repeal of the present system and that these lands be placed under the superintendence and management of the general land office as other public lands and be brought into market and sold upon such terms as congress in their wisdom may prescribe reserving to the government an equitable percentage of the gross amount of mineral product and that the preemption principle be extended to resident miners and settlers upon them at the minimum price which may be established by congress i refer you to the accompanying report of the secretary of war for information respecting the present situation of the army and its operations during the past year the state of our defenses the condition of the public works and our relations with the various indian tribes within our limits or upon our borders i invite your attention to the suggestions contained in that report in relation to these prominent objects of national interest when orders were given during the past summer for concentrating a military force on the western frontier of texas our troops were widely dispersed and in small detachments occupying posts remote from each other the prompt and expeditious manner in which an army embracing more than half our peace establishment was drawn together on an emergency so sudden reflects great credit on the officers who were entrusted with the execution of these orders 
as well as upon the discipline of the army itself to be in strength to protect and defend the people and territory of texas in the event mexico should commence hostilities or invade her territories with a large army which she threatened i authorized the general assigned to the command of the army of occupation to make requisitions for additional forces from several of the states nearest the texan territory and which could most expeditiously furnish them if in his opinion a larger force than that under his command and the auxiliary aid which under the circumstances he was authorized to receive from texas should be required the contingency upon which the exercise of this authority depended has not occurred the circumstances under which two companies of state artillery from the city of new orleans were sent into texas and mustered into the service of the united states are fully stated in the report of the secretary of war i recommend to congress that provision be made for the payment of these troops as well as a small number of texan volunteers whom the commanding general thought it necessary to receive or muster into our service during the last summer the first regiment of dragoons made extensive excursions through the indian country on our borders a part of them advancing nearly to the possessions of the hudson's bay company in the north and a part as far as the south pass of the rocky mountains and the headwaters of the tributary streams of the colorado of the west the exhibition of this military force among the indian tribes in those distant regions and the councils held with them by the commanders of the expeditions it is believed will have a salutary influence in restraining them from hostilities among themselves and maintaining friendly relations between them and the united states an interesting account of one of these excursions accompanies the report of the secretary of war under the direction of the war department brevet captain fremont of the corps of topographical engineers has been employed since eighteen forty two in exploring the country west of the mississippi and beyond the rocky mountains two expeditions have already been brought to a close and the reports of that scientific and enterprising officer have furnished much interesting and valuable information he is now engaged in a third expedition, but is not expected that this arduous service will be completed in season to enable me to communicate the result to Congress at the present session. Our relations with the Indian tribes are of a favorable character. The policy of removing them to a country designed for their permanent residence west of the Mississippi and without the limits of the organized states and territories is better appreciated by them than it was a few years ago. While education is now attended to and the habits of civilized life are gaining ground among them. Serious difficulties of long standing continue to distract the several parties into which the cherokees are unhappily divided the efforts of the government to adjust the difficulties between them have heretofore proved unsuccessful and there remains no probability that this desirable object can be accomplished without the aid of further legislation by congress i will at an early period of your session present the subject for your consideration accompanied with an exposition of the complaints and claims of the several parties into which the nation is divided with a view to the adoption of such measures by congress as may enable the executive to do justice to them respectively and to put an end if possible to the dissensions which have long prevailed and still prevail among them i refer you to the report of the secretary of the navy for the present condition of that branch of the national defense and for grave suggestions having for their object the increase of its efficiency and a greater economy in its management during the past year the officers and men have performed their duty in a satisfactory manner the orders which have been given have been executed with promptness and fidelity a larger force than has often formed one squadron under our flag was readily concentrated in the gulf of mexico and apparently without unusual effort 
it is especially to be observed that notwithstanding the union of so considerable a force no act was committed that even the jealousy of an irritated power could construe as an act of aggression and that the commander of the squadron and his officers in strict conformity with their instructions holding themselves ever ready for the most active duty have achieved the still purer glory of contributing to the preservation of peace it is believed that at all our foreign stations the honor of our flag has been maintained and that generally our ships of war have been distinguished for their good discipline and order i am happy to add that the display of maritime force which was required by the events of the summer have been made wholly within the usual appropriations for the service of the year so that no additional appropriations are required the commerce of the united states and with it the navigating interests have steadily and rapidly increased since the organization of our government until it is believed we are now second to but one power in the world and at no distant day we shall probably be inferior to none exposed as they must be it has been a wise policy to afford to these important interests protection with our ships of war distributed in the great highways of trade throughout the world for more than thirty years appropriations have been made and annually expended for the gradual increase of our naval forces in peace our navy performs the important duty of protecting our commerce and in the event of war will be as it has been a most efficient means of defense the successful use of steam navigation on the ocean has been followed by the introduction of war steamers in great and increasing numbers into the navies of the principal maritime powers of the world a due regard to our own safety and to an efficient protection to our large and increasing commerce demands a corresponding increase on our part no country has greater facilities for the construction of vessels of this description than ours or can promise itself greater advantages from their employment they are admirably adapted to the protection of our commerce to the rapid transmission of intelligence and to the coast defense in pursuance of the wise policy of a gradual increase of our navy large supplies of live oak timber and other materials for shipbuilding have been collected and are now under shelter and in a state of good preservation while iron steamers can be built with great facility in various parts of the union the use of iron as a material especially in the construction of steamers which can enter with safety many of the harbors along our coast now inaccessible to vessels of greater draft and the practicability of constructing them in the interior strongly recommend that liberal appropriations should be made for this important object whatever may have been our policy in the earlier stages of the government when the nation was in its infancy our shipping interests and commerce comparatively small our resources limited our population sparse and scarcely extending beyond the limits of the original thirteen states that policy must be essentially different now that we have grown from three to more than twenty millions of people that our commerce carried in our own ships is found in every sea and that our territorial boundaries and settlements have been so greatly expanded neither our commerce nor our long line of coast on the ocean and on the lakes can be successfully defended against foreign aggression by means of fortifications alone these are essential at important commercial and military points but our chief reliance for this object must be on a well-organized efficient navy the benefits resulting from such a navy are not confined to the atlantic states the productions of the interior which seek a market abroad are directly dependent on the safety and freedom of our commerce the occupation of the belize below new orleans by a hostile force would embarrass if 
not stagnate the whole export trade of the mississippi and affect the value of the agricultural products of the entire valley of that mighty river and its tributaries it has never been our policy to maintain large standing armies in time of peace they are contrary to the genius of our free institutions would impose heavy burdens on the people and be dangerous to public liberty our reliance for protection and defense on the land must be mainly on our citizen soldiers who will be ever ready as they ever have been ready in times past to rush with alacrity at the call of their country to her defense this description of force however cannot defend our coast harbors and inland seas nor protect our commerce on the ocean or the lakes these must be protected by our navy considering an increased naval force and especially of steam vessels corresponding with our growth and importance as a nation and proportioned to the increased and increasing naval power of other nations of vast importance as regards our safety and the great and growing interests to be protected by it i recommend the subject to the favorable consideration of congress the report of the postmaster general herewith communicated contains a detailed statement of the operations of his department during the past year it will be seen that the income from postages will fall short of the expenditures for the year between one million dollars and two million dollars this deficiency has been caused by the reduction of the rates of postage which was made by the act of the third of march last no principle has been more generally acquiesced in by the people than that this department should sustain itself by limiting its expenditures to its income congress has never sought to make it a source of revenue for general purposes except for a short period during the last war with great britain nor should it ever become a charge on the general treasury if congress shall adhere to this principle as i think they ought it will be necessary either to curtail the present mail service so as to reduce the expenditures or so to modify the act of the third of march last as to improve its revenues the extension of the mail service and the additional facilities which will be demanded by the rapid extension and increase of population on our western frontier will not admit of such curtailment as will materially reduce the present expenditures in the adjustment of the tariff of postages the interests of the people demand that the lowest rates be adopted which will produce the necessary revenue to meet the expenditures of the department i invite the attention of congress to the suggestions of the postmaster-general on this subject under the belief that such a modification of the late law may be made as will yield sufficient revenue without further calls on the treasury and with very little change in the present rates of postage proper measures have been taken in pursuance of the act of the third of march last for the establishment of lines of mail steamers between this and foreign countries the importance of this service commends itself strongly to favorable consideration with the growth of our country the public business which devolves on the heads of the several executive departments has greatly increased in some respects the distribution of duties among them seems to be incongruous and many of these might be transferred from one to another with advantage to the public interests a more auspicious time for the consideration of this subject by congress with a view to system in the organization of the several departments and a more appropriate division of the public business will not probably occur the most important duties of the state department relate to our foreign affairs by the great enlargement of the family of nations the increase of our commerce and the corresponding extension of our consular system the business of this department has been greatly increased in its present organization many duties of a domestic nature and consisting of details are devolved on the secretary of state which do not appropriately belong to the foreign department of the government and may properly be transferred to some other department one of these grows out of the present state of the law concerning the patent office which a few years since was a subordinate clerkship but has become a distinct bureau of great importance with an excellent internal organization it is still connected with the state department 
in the transaction of its business questions of much importance to inventors and to the community frequently arise which by existing laws are referred for decision to a board of which the secretary of state is a member these questions are legal and the connection which now exists between the state department and the patent office may with great propriety and advantage be transferred to the attorney general in his last annual message to congress mr madison invited attention to a proper provision for the attorney general as an important improvement in the executive establishment this recommendation was repeated by some of his successors the official duties of the attorney general have been much increased within a few years and his office has become one of great importance his duties may be still further increased with advantage to the public interests as an executive officer his residence and constant attention at the seat of government are required legal questions involving important principles and large amounts of public money are constantly referred to him by the president and executive departments for his examination and decision the public business under his official management before the judiciary has been so augmented by the extension of our territory and the acts of congress authorizing suits against the united states for large bodies of valuable public lands as greatly to increase his labors and responsibilities i therefore recommend that the attorney general be placed on the same footing with the heads of the other executive departments with such subordinate officers provided by law for his department as may be required to discharge the additional duties which have been or may be devolved upon him congress possesses the power of exclusive legislation over the district of columbia and i commend the interests of its inhabitants to your favorable consideration the people of this district have no legislative body of their own and must confide their local as well as their general interests to representatives in whose election they have no voice and over whose official conduct they have no control each member of the national legislature should consider himself as their immediate representative and should be the more ready to give attention to their interests and wants because he is not responsible to them i recommend that a liberal and generous spirit may characterize your measures in relation to them i shall be ever disposed to show a proper regard for their wishes and within constitutional limits shall at all times cheerfully cooperate with you for the advancement of their welfare i trust it may not be deemed inappropriate to the occasion for me to dwell for a moment on the memory of the most eminent citizen of our country who during the summer that has gone by has descended to the tomb the enjoyment of contemplating at the advanced age of near fourscore years the happy condition of his country cheered the last hours of andrew jackson who departed this life in the tranquil hope of a blessed immortality his death was happy his life had been eminently useful he had an unfaltering confidence in the virtue and capacity of the people and in the permanence of that free government which he had largely contributed to establish and defend his great deeds had secured to him the affections of his fellow citizens and it was his happiness to witness the growth and glory of his country which he loved so well he departed amidst the benedictions of millions of free men the nation paid its tribute to his memory at his tomb coming generations will learn from his example the love of country and the rights of man in his language on a similar occasion to the present i now commend you fellow citizens to the guidance of almighty god with a full reliance on his merciful providence for the maintenance of our free institutions and with an earnest supplication that whatever errors it may be my lot to commit in discharging the arduous duties which have devolved on me will find a remedy in the harmony and wisdom of your counsels james k polk End of section 3
Section 4 of State of the Union Addresses, 1845 to 1848. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. James Polk, December 2nd, 1846, Part 1. Fellow citizens of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, in resuming your labors in the service of the people, it is a subject of congratulation that there has been no period in our past history when all the elements of national prosperity have been so fully developed. Since your last session, no afflicting dispensation has visited our country. General good health has prevailed, abundance has crowned the toil of the husbandman, and labor in all its branches is receiving an ample reward, while education, science and the arts are rapidly enlarging the means of social happiness the progress of our country in her career of greatness not only in the vast extension of our territorial limits and the rapid increase of our population but in resources and wealth and in the happy condition of our people is without an example in the history of nations as the wisdom strength and beneficence of our free institutions are unfolded every day adds fresh motives to contentment and fresh incentives to patriotism our devout and sincere acknowledgments are due to the gracious giver of all good for the numberless blessings which our beloved country enjoys it is a source of high satisfaction to know that the relations of the united states with all other nations with a single exception are of the most amicable character sincerely attached to the policy of peace early adopted and steadily pursued by this government I have anxiously desired to cultivate and cherish friendship and commerce with every foreign power. The spirit and habits of the American people are favorable to the maintenance of such international harmony. In adhering to this wise policy, a preliminary and paramount duty obviously consists in the protection of our national interests from encroachment or sacrifice, and our national honor from reproach. These must be maintained at any hazard they admit of no compromise or neglect and must be scrupulously and constantly guarded in their vigilant vindication collision and conflict with foreign powers may sometimes become unavoidable such has been our scrupulous adherence to the dictates of justice in all our foreign intercourse that though steadily and rapidly advancing in prosperity and power we have given no just cause of complaint to any nation and have enjoyed the blessings of peace for more than thirty years from a policy so sacred to humanity and so salutary in its effects upon our political system we should never be induced voluntarily to depart the existing war with mexico was neither desired nor provoked by the united states on the contrary all honorable means were resorted to to avert it after years of endurance of aggravated and unredressed wrongs on our part Mexico, in violation of solemn treaty stipulations and of every principle of justice recognized by civilized nations, commenced hostilities, and thus by her own act forced the war upon us. Long before the advance of our army to the left bank of the Rio Grande, we had ample cause of war against Mexico, and had the United States resorted to this extremity, we might have appealed to the whole civilized world for the justice of our cause i deem it to be my duty to present to you on the present occasion a condensed review of the injuries we had sustained of the causes which led to the war and of its progress since its commencement this is rendered the more necessary because of the misapprehensions which have to some extent prevailed as to its origin and true character the war has been represented as unjust and unnecessary and as one of aggression on our part upon a weak and injured enemy such erroneous views though entertained by but few have been widely and extensively circulated not only at home but have been spread throughout mexico and the whole world a more effectual means could not have been devised to encourage the enemy and protract the war than to advocate and adhere to their cause and thus give them aid and comfort it is a source of national pride and exultation that the great body of our people have thrown no such obstacles in the way of the government in prosecuting the war successfully but have shown themselves to be eminently patriotic and ready to vindicate their country's honor and interests at any sacrifice the alacrity and promptness 
with which our volunteer forces rushed to the field on their country's call prove not only their patriotism but their deep conviction that our cause is just the wrongs which we have suffered from mexico almost ever since she became an independent power and the patient endurance with which we have borne them are without a parallel in the history of modern civilized nations there is reason to believe that if these wrongs had been resented and resisted in the first instance the present war might have been avoided one outrage however permitted to pass with impunity almost necessarily encouraged the perpetration of another until at last mexico seemed to attribute to weakness and indecision on our part a forbearance which was the offspring of magnanimity and of a sincere desire to preserve friendly relations with a sister republic scarcely had mexico achieved her independence which the united states were the first among the nations to acknowledge when she commenced the system of insult and spoliation which she has ever since pursued our citizens engaged in lawful commerce were imprisoned their vessels seized and our flag insulted in her ports if money was wanted the lawless seizure and confiscation of our merchant vessels and their cargoes was a ready resource and if to accomplish their purposes it became necessary to imprison the owners captains and crews it was done rulers superseded rulers in mexico in rapid succession but still there was no change in this system of depredation the government of the united states made repeated reclamations on behalf of its citizens but these were answered by the perpetration of new outrages promises of redress made by mexico in the most solemn forms were postponed or evaded the files and records of the department of state contain conclusive proofs of numerous lawless acts perpetrated upon the property and persons of our citizens by mexico and of wanton insults to our national flag the interposition of our government to obtain redress was again and again invoked under circumstances which no nation ought to disregard it was hoped that these outrages would cease and that mexico would be restrained by the laws which regulate the conduct of civilized nations in their intercourse with each other after the treaty of amity commerce and navigation of the fifth of april eighteen thirty one was concluded between the two republics but this hope soon proved to be vain the course of seizure and confiscation of the property of our citizens the violation of their persons and the insults to our flag pursued by mexico previous to that time were scarcely suspended for even a brief period although the treaty so clearly defines the rights and duties of the respective parties that it is impossible to misunderstand or mistake them in less than seven years after the conclusion of that treaty our grievances had become so intolerable that in the opinion of president jackson they should no longer be endured in his message to congress in february eighteen thirty seven he presented them to the consideration of that body and declared that the length of time since some of the injuries have been committed the repeated and unavailing applications for redress the wanton character of some of the outrages upon the property and persons of our citizens upon the officers and flag of the united states independent of recent insults to this government and people by the late extraordinary mexican minister would justify in the eyes of all nations immediate war in a spirit of kindness and forbearance however he recommended reprisals as a milder mode of redress he declared that war should not be used as a remedy by just and generous nations confiding in their strength for injuries committed if it can be honorably avoided and added it has occurred to me that considering the present embarrassed condition of that country we should act with both wisdom and moderation by giving to mexico one more opportunity to atone for the past before we take redress into our own hands to avoid all misconception on the part of mexico as well as to protect our own national character from reproach this opportunity should be given with the avowed design and full preparation to take immediate satisfaction if it should not be obtained on a repetition of the demand for it to this end i recommend that an act be passed authorizing reprisals and the use of the naval force of the united states by the executive against mexico to enforce them in the event of a refusal by the mexican government to come to an amicable adjustment of the matters in controversy between us upon another demand thereof made from on board out of our vessels of war on the coast of mexico 
Committees of both houses of Congress, to which this message of the President was referred, fully sustained his views of the character of the wrongs which we had suffered from Mexico, and recommended that another demand for redress should be made before authorizing war or reprisals. The Committee on Foreign Relations of the Senate, in their report, say, After such a demand, should prompt justice be refused by the Mexican government, we may appeal to all nations, not only for the equity and moderation with which we shall have acted toward a sister republic, but for the necessity which will then compel us to seek redress for our wrongs, either by actual war or by reprisals. The subject will then be presented before Congress, at the commencement of the next session, in a clear and distinct form, and the Committee cannot doubt but that such measures will be immediately adopted as may be necessary to vindicate the honor of the country and ensure ample reparation to our injured fellow citizens. The Committee on Foreign Affairs of the House of Representatives made a similar recommendation. In their report, they say that they fully concur with the President that ample cause exists for taking redress into our own hands, and believe that we should be justified in the opinion of other nations for taking such a step. But they are willing to try the experiment of another demand, made in the most solemn form upon the justice of the Mexican government before any further proceedings are adopted. No difference of opinion upon the subject is believed to have existed in Congress at that time. The executive and legislative departments concurred, and yet such has been our forbearance and desire to preserve peace with Mexico that the wrongs of which we then complained and which gave rise to these solemn proceedings not only remain unredressed to this day, but additional causes of complaint of an aggravated character have ever since been accumulating. Shortly after these proceedings, a special messenger was dispatched to Mexico to make a final demand for redress, and on the 20th of July, 1837, the demand was made. The reply of the Mexican government bears date on the 29th of the same month and contains assurances of the anxious wish of the Mexican government not to delay the moment of that final and equitable adjustment which is to terminate the existing difficulties between the two governments. That nothing should be left undone which may contribute to the most speedy and equitable determination of the subjects which have so seriously engaged the attention of the American government. That the Mexican government would adopt as the only guides for its conduct the plainest principles of public right, the sacred obligations imposed by international law, and the religious faith of treaties and that whatever reason and justice may dictate respecting each case will be done. The assurance was further given that the decision of the Mexican government upon each cause for complaint for which redress had been demanded should be communicated to the government of the United States by the Mexican minister at Washington. These solemn assurances in answer to our demand for redress were disregarded. By making them, however, Mexico obtained further delay. President Van Buren, in his annual message to Congress of the 5th of December, 1837, states that although the larger number of our demands for redress, and many of them aggravated cases of personal wrongs, have been now for years before the Mexican government, and some of the causes of national complaint, and those of the most offensive character, admitted of immediate, simple, and satisfactory replies, it is only within a few days past that any specific communication in answer to our last demand made five months ago has been received from the Mexican minister, and that for not one of our public complaints has satisfaction been given or offered, that but one of the cases of personal wrong has been favorably considered, and that but four cases of both descriptions, out of all those formally presented and earnestly pressed, have as yet been decided upon by the Mexican government. President Van Buren, believing that it would be vain to make any further attempt to obtain redress by the ordinary means within the power of the executive, communicated this opinion to Congress in the message referred to, in which he said, On a careful and deliberate examination of their contents of the correspondence with the Mexican government, and considering the spirit manifested by the Mexican government, it has become my painful duty to return the subject as it now stands to Congress to whom it belongs to decide upon the time, the mode, and the measure of redress. Had the United States at that time adopted compulsory measures and taken redress into their own hands, all our difficulties with Mexico would probably have been long since adjusted 
and the existing war have been averted. Magnanimity and moderation on our part only had the effect to complicate these difficulties and render an amicable settlement of them the more embarrassing. That such measures of redress under similar provocations committed by any of the powerful nations of Europe would have been promptly resorted to by the United States cannot be doubted. The national honor and the preservation of the national character throughout the world, as well as our own self-respect and the protection due to our own citizens, would have rendered such a resort indispensable. The history of no civilized nation in modern times has presented within so brief a period so many wanton attacks upon the honor of its flag, and upon the property and persons of its citizens, as had at that time been borne by the United States from the Mexican authorities and people. But Mexico was a sister republic on the North American continent, occupying a territory contiguous to our own, and was in a feeble and distracted condition, and these considerations, it is presumed, induced Congress to forbear still longer. Instead of taking redress into our own hands, a new negotiation was entered upon with fair promises on the part of Mexico, but with the real purpose, as the event has proved, of indefinitely postponing the reparation which we demanded, and which was so justly due. This negotiation, after more than a year's delay, resulted in the convention of the 11th of April, 1839, for the adjustment of claims of citizens of the United States of America upon the government of the Mexican Republic. The joint board of commissioners created by this convention to examine and decide upon these claims was not organized until the month of August, 1840, and under the terms of the convention they were to terminate their duties within 18 months from that time. Four of the 18 months were consumed in preliminary discussions on frivolous and dilatory points raised by the Mexican commissioners, and it was not until the month of December, 1840, that they commenced the examination of the claims of our citizens upon Mexico. Fourteen months only remained to examine and decide upon these numerous and complicated cases. In the month of February, 1842, the term of the commission expired, leaving many claims undisposed of for one of time. The claims which were allowed by the board and by the umpire authorized by the convention to decide in case of disagreement between the Mexican and American commissioners amounted to two million twenty six thousand one hundred thirty nine dollars and sixty eight cents there were pending before the umpire when the commission expired additional claims which had been examined and awarded by the american commissioners and had not been allowed by the mexican commissioners amounting to nine hundred and twenty eight thousand six hundred and twenty seven dollars and eighty eight cents upon which he did not decide alleging that his authority had ceased with the termination of the joint commission besides these claims there were others of American citizens amounting to three million three hundred and thirty six thousand eight hundred and thirty seven dollars and five cents which had been submitted to the board and upon which they had not time to decide before their final adjournment the sum of two million twenty six thousand one hundred and thirty nine dollars and sixty eight cents which had been awarded to the claimants was a liquidated and ascertained debt due by mexico about which there could be no dispute and which she was bound to pay according to the terms of the convention. Soon after the final awards for this amount had been made, the Mexican government asked for a postponement of the time of making payment, alleging that it would be inconvenient to make the payment at the time stipulated. In the spirit of forbearing kindness toward a sister republic, which Mexico has so long abused, the United States promptly complied with her request. A second convention was accordingly concluded between the two governments on the 30th of January, 1843, which, upon its face, declares that this new arrangement is entered into for the accommodation of Mexico. By the terms of this convention, all the interest due on the awards which had been made in favor of the claimants under the convention of the 11th of April, 1839, was to be paid to them on the 30th of April, 1843 and the principal of the said awards and the interest accruing thereon was stipulated to be paid in five years in equal installments every three months notwithstanding this new convention was entered into at the request of mexico and for the purpose of relieving her from embarrassment the claimants have only received the interest due on the thirtieth of april eighteen forty three and three of the twenty installments although the payment of the sum thus liquidated and confessedly due by mexico to our citizens 
as indemnity for acknowledged acts of outrage and wrong was secured by treaty the obligations of which are ever held sacred by all just nations yet mexico has violated this solemn engagement by failing and refusing to make the payment the two installments due in april and july eighteen forty four under the peculiar circumstances connected with them have been assumed by the united states and discharged to the claimants but they are still due by mexico but this is not all of which we have just cause of complaint to provide a remedy for the claimants whose cases were not decided by the joint commission under the convention of april eleventh eighteen thirty nine it was expressly stipulated by the sixth article of the convention of the thirtieth of january eighteen forty three that a new convention shall be entered into for the settlement of all claims of the government and citizens of the united states against the republic of mexico which were not finally decided by the late commission which met in the city of washington and of all claims of the government and citizens of mexico against the united states in conformity with this stipulation a third convention was concluded and signed at the city of mexico on the twentieth of november eighteen forty three by the plenipotentiaries of the two governments by which provision was made for ascertaining and paying these claims in january eighteen forty four this convention was ratified by the senate of the united states with two amendments which were manifestly reasonable in their character upon a reference of the amendments proposed to the government of mexico the same evasions difficulties and delays were interposed which have so long marked the policy of that government toward the united states it has not even yet decided whether it would or would not accede to them although the subject has been repeatedly pressed upon its consideration mexico has thus violated a second time the faith of treaties by failing or refusing to carry into effect the sixth article of the convention of january eighteen forty three such is the history of the wrongs which we have suffered and patiently endured from mexico through a long series of years so far from affording reasonable satisfaction for the injuries and insults we had borne a great aggravation of them consists in the fact that while the united states anxious to preserve a good understanding with mexico have been constantly but vainly employed in seeking redress for past wrongs new outrages were constantly occurring which have continued to increase our causes of complaint and to swell the amount of our demands while the citizens of the united states were conducting a lawful commerce with mexico under the guarantee of a treaty of amity commerce and navigation many of them have suffered all the injuries which would have resulted from open war this treaty instead of affording protection to our citizens has been the means of inviting them into the ports of mexico that they might be as they have been in numerous instances plundered of their property and deprived of their personal liberty if they dared insist on their rights had the unlawful seizures of american property and the violation of the personal liberty of our citizens to say nothing of the insults to our flag which have occurred in the ports of mexico taken place on the high seas they would themselves long since have constituted a state of actual war between the two countries in so long suffering mexico to violate her most solemn treaty obligations plunder our citizens of their property and imprison their persons without affording them any redress we have failed to perform one of the first and highest duties which every government owes to its citizens and the consequence has been that many of them have been reduced from a state of affluence to bankruptcy the proud name of american citizen which ought to protect all who bear it from insult and injury throughout the world has afforded no such protection to our citizens in mexico we had ample cause of war against mexico long before the breaking out of hostilities but even then we forbore to take redress into our own hands until mexico herself became the aggressor by invading our soil in hostile array and shedding the blood of our citizens such are the grave causes of complaint on the part of the united states against mexico causes which existed long before the annexation of texas to the american union and yet animated by the love of peace and a magnanimous moderation we did not adopt those measures of redress which under such circumstances are the justified resort of injured nations the annexation of texas to the united states constituted no just cause of offense to mexico 
the pretext that it did so is wholly inconsistent and irreconcilable with well-authenticated facts connected with the revolution by which texas became independent of mexico that this may be the more manifest it may be proper to advert to the causes and to the history of the principal events of that revolution texas constituted a portion of the ancient province of louisiana ceded to the united states by france in the year eighteen o three in the year eighteen nineteen the united states by the florida treaty ceded to spain all that part of louisiana within the present limits of texas and mexico by the revolution which separated her from spain and rendered her an independent nation succeeded to the rights of the mother country over this territory in the year eighteen twenty four mexico established a federal constitution under which the mexican republic was composed of a number of sovereign states confederated together in a federal union similar to our own each of these states had its own executive legislature and judiciary and for all except federal purposes was as independent of the general government and that of the other states as is pennsylvania or virginia under our constitution texas and coahuila united and formed one of these mexican states the state constitution which they adopted and which was approved by the mexican confederacy asserted that they were free and independent of the other mexican united states and of every other power and dominion whatsoever and proclaimed the great principle of human liberty that the sovereignty of the state resides originally and essentially in the general mass of the individuals who compose it to the government under this constitution as well as to that under the federal constitution the people of texas owed allegiance emigrants from foreign countries including the united states were invited by the colonization laws of the state and of the federal government to settle in texas advantageous terms were offered to induce them to leave their own country and become mexican citizens this invitation was accepted by many of our citizens in the full faith that in their new home they would be governed by laws enacted by representatives elected by themselves and that their lives liberty and property would be protected by constitutional guarantees similar to those which existed in the republic they had left under a government thus organized they continued until the year eighteen thirty five when a military revolution broke out in the city of mexico which entirely subverted the federal and state constitutions and placed a military dictator at the head of the government by a sweeping decree of a congress subservient to the will of the dictator the several state constitutions were abolished and the states themselves converted into mere departments of the central government the people of texas were unwilling to submit to this usurpation resistance to such tyranny became a high duty texas was fully absolved from all allegiance to the central government of mexico from the moment that government had abolished her state constitution and in its place substituted an arbitrary and despotic central government such were the principal causes of the texan revolution the people of texas at once determined upon resistance and flew to arms in the midst of these important and exciting events however they did not omit to place their liberties upon a secure and permanent foundation they elected members to a convention who in the month of march eighteen thirty six issued a formal declaration that their political connection with the mexican nation has forever ended and that the people of texas do now constitute a free sovereign and independent republic and are fully invested with all the rights and attributes which properly belong to independent nations they also adopted for their government a liberal republican constitution about the same time santa anna then the dictator of mexico invaded texas with a numerous army for the purpose of subduing her people and enforcing obedience to his arbitrary and despotic government on the twenty first of april eighteen thirty six he was met by the texan citizen soldiers and on that day was achieved by them the memorable victory of san jacinto by which they conquered their independence considering the numbers engaged on the respective sides history does not record a more brilliant achievement santa anna himself was among the captives in the month of may eighteen thirty six santa anna acknowledged by a treaty with the texan authorities in the most solemn form the full entire and perfect independence of the republic of texas it is true he was then a prisoner of war but it is equally true that he had failed to reconquer texas and had met with signal defeat that his authority had not been revoked 
and that by virtue of this treaty he obtained his personal release. By it, hostilities were suspended, and the army which had invaded Texas under his command returned in pursuance of this arrangement unmolested to Mexico. From the day that the Battle of San Jacinto was fought until the present hour, Mexico has never possessed the power to reconquer Texas. In the language of the Secretary of State of the United States, in a dispatch,